one of those little um, pen lights. All right. Are you are you hearing me? Okay, guys. Yeah. Yes. yes. Excellent. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you, sweetie? You know what? We got uh, 14 households online, oh, great. which is nice. Hi, and we have for you. Come sit near me so I don't feel lonely. Okay. Thank you. I yeah. wondered if I was here the wrong night. No, you are well, It is the wrong night. I know. I have tomorrow night we're going to get to Thanksgiving. And I couldn't mess that up. I, I oh, I thought maybe because tomorrow night we're at our twin at the church. Is exactly. That That's going to be Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know, you know what to do. And I said, oh, we'll just make it the night before. What are you going to do? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. It's never easy. No. There's always too much to do. Yes, that's true. Right. Even if you're not a rabbi. Uh, even if you're not a rabbi, it's totally correct. You know, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be a rabbi. Right. You have to be have too much going on. You have on. to have a mother who's 111. That's. Yeah. I, I told somebody that they didn't believe me. Uh, I actually told Mara. I saw Mara for Oh really? Yeah, she's from town. And I said, you won't believe how old Lynn Adler's mother is. <laughs> I said, I think she's 110 or maybe 111. You know what? On 11 1, she was 111. Wow. Uh -huh. Well, she is really, I, I, she is really something. And you know what? She still has nothing wrong. You know, she's still fully present. Amazing. It's amazing. Amazing. So let's give, we're going to give it, uh, let's see, 731 barely. We have 16 households online. We're going to wait for Julian to come back in the bathroom, and then we'll start. <laughs> Not that we're giving, we're doing the TMI thing here, guys. But we're, we're a very close congregation. Mm -hmm. We share whatever. We share whatever. So we just want everybody to be well. Um, good, good, good. Let me just do a little, uh, little CRN. Eh? Who's here? We have the Landau's. Michelle is here from down south. They yes. sell the. There's Arnie, there's Minna, there's Marvin, maybe Candy, Stephen D, Stephen D's iPad, Stephen D. Are they Zooming D. for convenience or help? Adrian. Or combination. Jerry, Karen Moore, there's Lisa, there's Marie. I followed up on so. Wendy's tip the other night. Okay. Good. They, but they wanted someone full time. And well, yeah. Well, you're beyond that now. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And <clears throat> Wendy said the, the Wendy's comment was the high school did you in. So. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't so much. Okay. Should we so check weird. on her? I mean, I, I just worry. Okay. I'm, I worry about people. I mean, you know, God, God willing, everything is good. He should take his time. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Am I tan? No. Um, you know what? I, I, uh, when I, 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 um, I have very olive skin. Do you? I do. My son Gabriel, yeah. And my, Gabe has it too. My boys, my big boys take care after my wife's family, which is very fair. light, very yeah, fair. Susan yeah, Susan was fair. Yeah. Anybody else want to know anything about my family background? Uh, we're ready to share anything. This is really a covenantal moment. <laughs> um, oh my God! It's called the owl. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And here we're just going to. So now Charlie's going to talk. Let's see if it works. Just to do a test. Charlie, just say hello. Hello. Keep talking. Okay. Good to see everybody. So it's always good to see all of you and it's popping up. That's good. That's good. So you guys heard Charlie just talking, yes? If I do gallery views, oh, the problem does, does that is do you see now um, us still? I guess it depends on how you have it setting up your computer. If it's speaker or gallery, correct? So whatever you want to do is fine with me. Um, this is our second session of coming home. How is Judaism a journey home? 
and we are tonight focusing on each other. In other words, coming home to dot 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 or colon each other. And the operative question is, how does the exchange and the dialogue we share enable holiness and sacred connection? It's not a hard question, but it's a concept we don't always actualize. So tonight, I just want to give you the foundations of why we should actualize that um, and what that means in our lives, especially as we approach the holiday that's coming up a week from tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, it begins in, um, because I, you know, literally right now, you should just know, um, I have just found the book I think should be next year's Congregational Learning Theme, and I just wrote two days ago to the author. Um, so I try to work about a year in advance, a little less, but I think next year's Learning Theme will be bad enough. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but if she says yes, it'll be great. It'll be great. Um, you'll love her, and you know who she is. This year's theme, I started last year when we were in the midst of wanting to be home together. And we couldn't. And I remember back to when I taught a course in the Hamptons, that's the Jewish center of the Hamptons, in East Hampton, New York, for my friend, and I used baseball to understand Judaism as a journey home. And I used the baseball writings of Bart Giamatti. So the little quote on the top, underneath the heading, um, is something that I repeat in different ways every time. Uh, home is a concept, not a place. It's a state of mind where self-definition starts. Home is the goal, rarely, rarely glimpsed. It's about rejoining a beloved, rejoining parents and children, about putting things right after some tragedy has put them asunder. Home is about restoration of the right relations, and going home is where that restoration occurs because that is where it matters most. Giamatti was actually writing metaphorically. Remember, he was a, uh, a professor of literature. Literature? Um, medieval? Some kind of literature. It wasn't modern. At Yale. Um, who became the commissioner of baseball. Uh, and what, he, what I think he's really writing about is the journey. Is our life journey. And so it's not a big leap to go from the idea of the hope to go home to how do we come home to each other and for each other. Um, it, 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 it's the Jewish value is chesed that we're going to hold up today. Chesed. Chesed wouldn't necessarily be the value you think about at Thanksgiving, but you should. Chesed is like the pillars of our covenant. Torah, Avodah, and Gemilut, Chasadim. When you say somebody's a Chasid, what are you really saying? This could be a deep irony if you go to Muncie. They are filled with loving kindness. When I was 17 and a half, turning 18, and walking through Mea Sha'arim with my two friends, girls who had shorts on, and little Hasidic kids were stoning us, I don't mean getting high together, I mean throwing stones at us. It was not the epitome of loving kindness. So what is this loving kindness about? Um, Judy Landau. Wait a minute. Tom Landau's walking in the building, and there's Judy Landau online. Judy, can I'm you home. Un At home. Can you unmute Judy and give us the uh, it's time to reclaim chesed, covenantal love. That's, the, that's sort of the basis where we're going to start. Um, it is time to reclaim chesed, covenantal love, as the imperative of our age, and to assert it is as the central religious value of Judaism. Chesed is different from ava, simply love, and emotion burnished on the inside. It is emotion that translates into loving response. Chesed is the process of embodied love. Love is as love does. Rabbi so, oh, okay. yeah, so this is Bradley Shami Artson, uh, great conservative rabbi. 
um, who's much more liberal than conservative. Um, and he was the dean of, America, of uh, um, University of Judaism in LA, which was a seminary for the conservative movement. Um, Archon makes the distinction. When you say, after the, after the Shema, what prayer do we say? Ve'ahavta, right? The Ve'ahavta. What do you say? And you shall love Adonai your God with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your being. Um, it would make more sense, in our sense understanding, for the word to be Chesed, not Ahava. Because Ahava is a love that could be reserved for those people we love most or that deserve or merit that love. Chesed is covenantal love. We share it with each other because we share a covenant because we're all human beings created in the image of God. That's a much harder and more challenging operative assumption because that clerk at CBS this afternoon that was a little short with me, my response was to kill him with kindness. <laughs> I didn't really want to kill him because I don't want to hurt anybody, but I wanted him to know how upset I was that he wasn't being nice. So the way I did it was by being nice. That is a response that comes from Chesed. It's hard to do. I'm conditioned to do it. <clears throat> My life partner didn't do it. <laughs> she let people know exactly what she thought. And uh, most of the time it worked for her. Sometimes it worked against me, but that's okay. That's okay. Rabbi, so, Jeffrey, yes. Jeffrey, <clears throat> did it change? Did it change his attitude? Did he understand what you were doing? Um, you know what changed his attitude? The person behind me said, hi, Rabbi. <laughs> that was he it. He said, oh my God, a rabbi, right. And then I, I heard him, I think he may have said, oh shit. Yeah. I think he said that. <laughs> which, which as far as I, I don't care, I was great. But he treated me very nicely thereafter. It was really nice. Um, <clears throat> so what's the th my foundation? How do we get chesed? How do we wrap our arms around chesed? How do we emulate covenantal love? You need one book. I and thou. That's Boomer. That's I and thou. Uh, this is a special copy of I and thou. I'll show you who gave me this copy. I have an original print copy, but this is a third edition copy. Can you see who gave me that copy? No? No. Too bad. It says Rita Grunbaum. Uh, uh, so this is Rita Grunbaum's copy of I Am Now, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, very special and dear to me. We'll come back to Rita later. Um, so we're going to read some I Am Now. I Am Now, and I know a lot about I Am Now. Why? Because um, I Am Now is written by Martin Buber. Um, it's written in, published in 1921. It's written in 1915 to 1919. It's written in response to uh, a graduate student who came to Professor Buber, Herr Buber, at um, the university where he's teaching and asked him a few questions and then left. And there's two stories. He either died thereafter or was found hanging in his room three days after. Um, and Buber blamed himself, not because he was directly responsible, but because he wasn't fully present. Remember, Buber is the guy in 1904-56 who, because he's so brilliant, and because his grandfather, with whom he lived because his parents were divorced, Solomon Buber was a great Midrash scholar and lived among the Hasidim, the real Hasidim. Buber translated the Hasidic tales from Yiddish into high German, and we got them in English because of Buber. So Buber understands the essence of chesed, of loving kindness. What does he do? He writes a life philosophy that becomes among, I would say, the three major works of Jewish, of existentialism, not Jewish, of existentialism most read in the 20th century. Um, everybody reads I am they, they still read it. 
Many of my confirmands, my 10th graders who go away, come back 10 or 15 years later, and they, or, they, or they email me two years later and say, I'm in my philosophy class and we're reading I am now, I can't believe it. I know this. So what is I am now and why is it life changing? And how does it bring us to covenant to love? One of the Harrisons is gonna start us out. I'm gonna ask questions with each parable. Boober, and I, I, I excerpted this by the way, and, um, and we're just gonna take little bits of it. We'll come back to a little more. This is from the first section of the book, Adrian. The world is twofold for man in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the two basic words he can speak. The basic words are not single, but word pairs. One is the basic word pair, I, thou. The other is the basic word pair, I, it. Thus, the I of man is also twofold, for the I of the basic word, I, thou, is different from the basic word pair, I, it. So what is Buber doing? He's defining how we relate to our world. We do it in two ways. Either I, thou, or I, it. Meaning how we relate to the people who share our world. They're different. But depending upon how we relate to the other, we become different as well. All right, you're on a roll, Adrian, be a little more. When a person says I, he means the I of I thou or the I of I it. Whoever speaks one of the basic words enters into the word and stands within it. Whoever says thou does not have something for his object. For wherever there is something, there is also another something. On other its, but where thou is spoken, there is no something, for thou has no borders. Whoever says thou does not have me something, he has nothing, but he stands in relation. Let me explain what Booker's talking about. Please. Any idea? <laughs> By the way, it, it is excerpted from two different pages, so it's hard to understand. But again, this is this is this is classic Booker. Whoever speaks one of the basic words enters into the word and stands within it. That means my I exists in relationship. So what is an I in relationship? It borders on something. It borders on an, on an it, an I it, and it is objective, meaning I get something in exchange for it. An I-it relationship somehow implies I need something from you, you need something from me, there are things involved. Um, it's a condition. It's a condition. Um, and, and it's important. There are, we need I-it relationships to make the world go around. So what's different about an i thou relationship? Where thou is spoken, there is no something, for thou has no borders. There's no agenda. Good. No agenda. No hidden no agenda. agenda. He has nothing, but he stands in relation. The goal of all life, to stand in relation. It's about connection. It's about connection. By the way, I'm not giving you the answers yet. And on these, on these, I actually know the answers. I'll tell you why when we get to the end of my life. Um, all right, Minnie, you ready to read? Those who experience do not participate. You got to unmute them. Those who experience do not participate in the world, for the experience is in them and not between them in the world. The world experience belongs to the basic word I, it. The basic word I, thou establishes the world of relation. The world is set in the context of space and time. The world of now is not set in the context of either of these. Okay. So now we're getting a little, a little more clear between I, it, and I, thou. An I, it relationship is experiencing. 
That's a negative for Buber, or a, that's a mundane, objectified experience. But the word I thou is related, much higher level of being. The I it relationship is time bound. The I thou relationship is transcendent. It is not limited by time. Or when you're in it, you don't know what time it is. I use as an example with the 10th grade confirmance. I've been using it for a long time. When my wife was with us, and sometimes she still is, and my wife, right? I use the example of what Wednesdays used to be in my life, which were Wednesday morning, I went to breakfast at the diner. And I may have been the rabbi, but I wore a baseball hat, and I sat at the booth. You remember when the Nautilus Diner had um, those little jukebox thingies where you put the quarter in, sure. right, and press songs? And of course, because, because Susan would like to embarrass me, she would sing the songs with the jukebox and want me to sing with her, right? So that's what she would do, but we were just there. We may stay two hours, it didn't matter. Breakfast could start at 8.30 or quarter or nine, but we would just hang out. And it was timeless. And because we were in relationship for a very long time, we were 16 or 18 or 20 again. It didn't matter. Um, and so it's time, it makes time stand still because you are inside the relationship. It's transcendent. And what, what do the kids relate to? 10th graders will say, I'll say, when was the last, last time you lost track of time being with friends? And eight out of 10 will say, camp. The last night of camp. A night of my bunking camp. Some will say, driving on a long trip with my father or mother. Singing, talking, being with a friend. Right? But we can all think of those moments when we lost track. We, we were so in the moment and enjoying the moment together. It was open-hearted, affirming, non-judgmental, being fully present for another and with another. That's Ida. Um, now, Mina, Immerman, can you read us, can, can you unmute? And we're going to go a little more. Okay. Rabbi Zirkman, I couldn't, I couldn't print out the lesson because my printer isn't working. Will you put it on the screen? Uh, you know, if I do that, I'm not going to see everybody. So I'll call on somebody else. I yeah. love you dearly. But I'll, I'll listen. Talk I'll listen. Okay. It, it's good for me. Do you have it? Michelle, you have it? You have it, Michelle? All right. Yes, I have it. Can you read a person? Sure. A person makes his appearance by being connected. The primary word, I, thou, can only be spoken with the whole being. The aim of relation is relation itself. That is, contact with a thou. For through, through contact with every thou, we are stirred by a breath of the thou. That is, of eternal life. So Boomer's saying something that he's going to tell us more about later especially in the third part of the book, which is, um, remember, Buber is the primary Jewish existentialist. There is another one, Franz Rosenzweig, with whom Buber partners in translating the Bible into dialogic German, into the German that the text reflects the Hebrew, the original dialogue. And I'll tell you a story about their own relationship. Um, but Buber understands that somehow, when you enter into an I thou relationship, you glimpse eternity. Hmm. That's big. That's big. Even more than that, right? Um, Michelle, you want to read a little more? Relation is reciprocity? Sure. Relation is reciprocity. My thou acts on me as I act on it. Our students teach us, our works form us. Inscrutably involved, we live in the currents of universal reciprocity. The one who stands in relation shares in reality. Where, where there is no sharing, there is no reality. The eye is real by virtue of its sharing in reality. 
the fuller it's sharing, the more real it becomes. The ah, well, uh, 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 what, so what is Boomer saying? Boomer just said something transformation. Life becomes more real when it's shared. Life becomes more real when it's shared. Where there is no sharing, there is no reality. What does he mean? The I is real by virtue of its sharing in reality. There is nothing without each other. There's nothing without each other. Okay. Boomer's saying more than that. What else is Boomer saying here? He's talking about I thou relationships. I think you have to open yourself up and expose yourself. Okay, you have to expose yourself. There has to be true reciprocal openness. Okay, I like that. So, the um, only thing that's truly real. Right? The only thing that's true, she's getting close now. Lynn Nigel is talking, she's getting close. So, the, the only thing, the only thing that real, that's truly real is relationship, is I thou relationship. And so if we want to share in reality, you can have a small, a lowercase r or an uppercase r reality. You do that through I thou relationship, which you can't enter into on command. It only happens when two people are in the moment and able to treat each other with that mutuality, trust, non-judgmental presence accepting, embracing, right? Doesn't always happen. Yeah, um, I think Gruber felt when it does happen, that, that, that is holiness. When it does happen, that is holiness. That's good, that's good, right? Clearly, she's hearing, I like that. Um, and now, now he goes on, uh, just finish it up. Uh, the individual vow, must become an, an it when the event of relation has run its course. The individual it can become a thou by entering into the event of relation. Hear this, without it, one cannot live, but the one who lives with it alone is not really living. Right, so, um, so Buber famously said, all real life is meaning, meaning, I it relationships are crucial. Name an I it relationship in your life. I'll give you an example. The clerk at CVS, that's very I it. The grocer, the cleaning guy, your child, your husband, your partner, your mother. Keep going, right? So at every moment, we relate to the people closest to us in an I it way. I need something from you, you need something from me, I'll give you that in exchange for that. Don't forget your responsibility, you owe me this, you told me you'd pick me up at X, whatever it is. Those are I, it realities, but if you only live in I, it, you're not really living. All real life is meeting. You have to meet the other because the possibility exists that other will be your thou, or a thou in your life. This is the foundation of covenantal love. We're gonna build on this, because somehow, Buber understands God within every I thou relationship. That's how you find God. The only way you find God. Remind me to tell you a story about Buber and Rosen's five? After. Yeah, a minute. Oh, sorry, um, I'm having trouble hearing. It's a little bit echoey. Did you say? It's echoey. Hold on a second. Let me see. Let me see. Wait a minute. I'm going to go here. I have the echo canceling speaker phone, but let me try this. Does this sound any different? Much better. Oh, oh my God. Fabulous. Much better. Much better. I feel so good now. I really okay. do. So, All right. were you saying all real life is meeting? Meeting? Yes. Meeting. All real life is meeting. meeting. Meeting, not meaning. Meeting. All real life is meeting. That's what Thank Bruber you. said. Thank 
Thank you. He said it in German. And years ago, I used to know it in German. But now, I don't know what it was. Um, but that's what it was. Um, so I put Hasidic tails in between pieces of Buber, at least this piece, because the Hasidic tail is Buber's heart. And it speaks the reality of covenantal love of how we come home to each other. Rabbi Charlie is going to give us this great Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasso tale. Please, Charlie. Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasso tells this tale. How to love is something I learned from two Polish peasants sitting at a table in the local tavern. With each drink, Ivan and Olaf toasted one another. Your wife, your livelihood, your horses, your children. Horses before children. <laughs> uh, moved by the wine, one asked the other, Ivan, tell me, do you love me? And his friend responded, Of course I love you. Then tell me, my friend, what causes me greatest pain in this life? And his friend replied, How should I know? To which he replied, If you don't know what pains me, then how can you say that you love me? Mm. This is a wonderful and challenging story. Wonderful and challenging. What, are, what, are the, what is uh, Rabbi Moshe Leib? And remember, the original Hasidic masters, um, why were they so successful? They, when you think of Hasidim today, nothing like the original Hasidim. The original Hasidim in the 19th century had as their disciples, as their people, a bunch of peasants, mostly illiterate Jewish peasants. So how did they teach them? They told stories. And the stories got told from one peasant, one group of people to another. And so the Rebbe became larger than life because he was the star of the story. But the stories each had a key life lesson. Anybody can learn them because you all, everybody loves a good story. So this is a story of Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasov, the Sasov Rebbe, which is telling us something about chesed, covenantal love, which is easier said than done. What is it telling us? It's telling you that in order to know another person, you have to know what's in their heart. Okay, you have to know what's in their heart? What, what, what's meaningful for them. Okay. What, what moves them. Okay. Uh, how they connect how they connect to the god within okay this, this story is saying something more even basic and challenging which is what hurts me if you don't know what hurts me how can you say you love me i have to take the good with the bad say it again say it again you have to take the good with the bad you have to take the good with the bad, okay. Or the bad with the good. Or the bad with the good. I also think that it's describing a relationship that seems deep, but is really superficial. Um, right, so, right. one of the students of Moshe Leib, right, or, or the, wants to know what love is, and Moshe Leib tells the tale. He uses two peasants in a, in a, a tavern, having schnapps, drinking, whatever they're drinking, and you think they're having a great time. You think they really care about each other. If you don't know what causes me pain, says one peasant, what a great, right? What a great moment. How can you say you love me? So now translate that to the people around us. Sometimes I will be honest. Sometimes it is impossible to know what pains the people who are closest to us. It's impossible to truly know their hearts unless they share it. And sometimes even when they share it, we're not quite sure because we're not them. But generally speaking in the world, how can we say, you know, I'll give you an example. I got my Wednesday call from Wayne Powell, my dear friend, Wayne. Wayne Powell is the, of course the, uh, the black minister, the, the bishop of the straight gate church community. Um, I know what pains Bishop Powell because we talk about it all the time. Because he calls me in the middle of Rachel Maddow and said, did you hear what Rachel said? Can you believe that? Right. What is that guy? Talking? So we both have same re the similar reactions. I'm clearly not a black minister, but 
because he shared the depth of prejudice and racism and hate that's been hurled at him in life. And I think because he is responds to it with love, transcendent, powerful love, Wayne understands and he shares it. So I know what hurts him. I know what pains him. He knows what pains me. That's taken 30 years of relationship to develop. It doesn't happen overnight. But the story is implying something. If we're not open to the people around us, if we're not willing to learn, how many times a day do you say, hey, how are you? But you, you, know, I, you know, I don't really wanna know how Lisa is. Do I wanna take the time to listen to at least the next 20 minutes of how Lisa is? Oi, 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 of course I do, because I love Lisa. But most of the time when we ask, we don't wanna know. It's a superficial, hey, how you doing? How are you? Oh, so good to see you, how are you? If we only listened, we would learn. And that's the beginning of chesed, of covenantal love. Not easy. Sometimes impossible, but we can always try. Now we're gonna, we're doing so well with time. We're gonna have time for questions at the end and we're gonna have a discussion about a specific text you'll like. So we're building now. So, um, you know, this is all about um, coming home to each other. I called it the family Israel. Um, but according to Buber, in coming home to each other, we also come home to God, to the Holy One. Really? Yes. So now, who wants to read a little I vow? Who's up for reading? Who has the text? Tom Landau's going to read a little. Um, all right, Tom, you're going to read a little. And then I'm going to call on uh, somebody else. Then I'm going to call on uh, one of the Greens, or I don't know if Jerry Fennard has the text. One of you guys. If you have the text, okay, good. I'm going to call on Jerry after I call on Tom. So, Tom, start us out. No, 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 Tom, you're a page ahead of us, buddy. You should be in search of the eternal vow. This is now from the third part of the book of I Thou, Buber. It's close. Right? The extended lines of relation all meet in the eternal vow. Already, Buber is, you know is blowing our minds because he's saying somehow that your relationships lead you to the eternal vow. That is the holy. Go ahead, Tom. Stop. So what is he saying? What is Buber saying? What's he talking about? He's talking about God somehow. Every particular thou is a glimpse through to the eternal thou. That means when I'm in an I thou relationship with another human being or an I thou moment, That's where God is. right? Somehow I get a glimpse of God. I get a taste, a feeling of that holiness. Minna. God is the space between <clears throat> the I and the them. God, God is in the space between the I and the them. I love that. I love that. Buber wouldn't say that exactly, but the implication is beautiful. I love it because one of my three prepositions that defines God is between, right? Within, between, beyond. That's my theology. That's, the, that's all you have to know. Three words. Um, so between, yes, the betweenness for me is sacred. Buber isn't quite saying that. He's implying that we enter into relationship and through that relationship, 
we get a glimpse, not between, right, it, of God's presence. But for Buber, God's presence isn't what we think it is. Remember, Buber is the ultimate existentialist. I know all this, full reveal, you know this, or you may remember, because my teacher of Buber at Boston University was Nachum Glatzer. Professor Glatzer was Buber's note taker from 1916 or 17 to 1926 before he came to America with his PhD. So I learned Buber from the guy who was Buber's note taker and editor on his works. Professor Glatzer would teach us that Professor Buber, Herr Buber, um, understood that when you enter into true relationship, that's as close to God as you can get. Buber was partnered, as I said before, with Franz Rosenzweig. They were writing the translation of um, the Bible in German in a dialogic ma manner. And um, they also, uh, Rosenzweig was the head in Frankfurt of the Lair House, the free open adult learning society to try to renew the Judaism of German Jewry because in 1921, he felt that German Jewry was in trouble. He didn't know the half of it. Mm -hmm. um, but after the opening of the Lair House, Rosenzweig started to get sick. And even though Buber and Rosenzweig would get together, Berlin, Frankfurt regularly um, and correspond because we have the letters which Glatz are published, um, Buber ended up coming to Frankfurt more and more and more. By 1924, Rosenzweig, they didn't know what it was at the time, had use of two fingers um, and, uh, and one eye maybe. Um, it was Lou Gehrig's disease. But he could still type and he could still, you know, make you could write a little bit with the hand. Um, and the story goes that Boober in the room with, get who's in the room. It's Friday afternoon. Rosenzweig wants to daven Mincha. He's a traditional Jew who came to tradition. Boober is a secular Jew, but grew up in an Orthodox house, his grandfather's. Buber doesn't believe any of it. Buber sm smokes his pipe on Shabbos, taking a walk. He eats tray. He doesn't care because God isn't commanding him. God is in dialogue with him. That's how he understands God. Rosenzweig understands a commanding God. But the story goes that in the room is Rosenzweig, Glatzer, Rosenzweig's wife, Eric Fromm and Buber, right? These are the guys who were teaching in the lair house. They may have been one other person in the room. I don't remember. There was a call, Eugen Kohlmann, my teacher. Okay, I love that. I love that. I love that. So they can't find his cedar, his, his, his uh, prayer book. And so what does Buber do for his friend Rosenzweig? He davens the service by heart <laughs> as Rosenzweig mouths it, can't really say anything but sings along and sort of smiles. That is the ultimate I thou act. It's not for him, but because of his relationship, he davened it by heart. It wasn't the way he approached God, but because his friend wanted it, that's all that mattered. So now how is I thou a glimpse of the eternal thou? Jerry, keep us going to step into pure relation. Just got to unmute, Jerry. Now, for some reason, you're still muted. Wait a minute. Uh, oh, there you go. There you go, Jerry. To step into pure relation is to see everything in the vow. Pure world, their God is the language of it. But to include the whole world in the vow, to include nothing beside God, but everything in him, this is complete relation. A little more. In every thou, the eternal voice sounds forth. The relation with man is the real simile of the relation with, relation with God. In it, true address receives true response. 
right? So Buber and Rosenzweig had a correspondence. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, in fact, it's in, it's in a book called On Revelation. And um, their correspondence, a lot of it, and it, they're these so personal letters, but what are they writing about? How they understand God at Mount Sinai, commanding the people of Israel, the Ten Commandments, and what revelation is. And um, Rosenzweig says um, that after um, uh, the first two words of the first commandment, Anochi Adonai, the rest is commentary, but it's the commentary of a commanding God. Buber says, all you need is Anochi. What is Anochi? I. Because that helps you enter into a dialogue with the Holy One. And your life is a dialogue with others that reflects or echoes a dialogue with the Holy One. The deeper you climb into a relationship with the other, the more God is present. Which is why he says, the relation with man is the real simile of the relation with God. Um, so where do you find God? How do you get God through this covenantal love? Finish it up, Jerry. One does not find God if he stays in the world. One does not find God if he leaves the world. But the one who goes out with his whole being to meet his thou and carries to it all being that is in the world finds the one who cannot be sought. Yeah, it, <laughs> right. So did Buber go to the sanctuary of the synagogue to pray? No. Are you kidding me? No. Um, Buber talked to people. Remember, Buber's a rebel. When Buber moves to, um, to Israel and begins to teach at Hebrew University, he writes an essay in 1948-49 called Hebrew Humanism. What was it about? A binational state. His home was pelted with eggs and rocks. 1948-49, Buber's talking about a binational state. Because we're Jews, they're Arabs, we come from the same house. How can we not be in dialogue with each other? How can we not try to understand each other? Covenantal love is the aim. Buber believes that through covenantal love, the Holy One is present and appears. I give you another Hasidic tale um, to underscore what covenantal love is about. You'll tell me why this, to me, is the ultimate tale of covenantal love. Um, somebody, the one of the greens want to read? Whoever feels up to it? On the eve of the Day of Atonement. When the time had come to chant the Kohen Day, everyone was gathered together in the synagogue, but the rabbi was nowhere to be seen. As everyone waited patiently, one woman thought to herself, let me just run up the street to check on my sleeping child. I'll be back by the time the rabbi arrives. So the mother ran home, and before entering the child's room, listened at the door. Everything was pin drop quiet, but as she turned the knob to peek in, there was Rabbi Moshe Lieb of Sasso, holding the child in his arms, fast asleep. He softly explained, I was rushing to go to, shul, to get to shul, but as I passed by your door, I heard a child crying. I stopped, and as I entered, he seemed to be scared. So I rocked him and we sang together and he fell back to sleep. But by then I had already forgotten what day it was. Right? Uh. <laughs> Interesting that this story is not only told about Rebbe Moshe, but it's also told about the Salam. Right. It's told about a number of rabbis a number have of a, rabbis. a similar story. Similar story. Good motif. What's the motif saying to us? How does covenant love the holiest, the holiest the encounters? The holiest, uh, the holiest, say it again, Andy. The holiest encounters are the ones where with other people. The holiest oh. encounter that's where you that's where you find God. Okay, okay. Something more. Timeless. Timeless, good. It's it's really, it's, it's very eye-thou in its, in its framing. 
It, maybe it's it, more. It, say it again, yeah. Luis. Uh, maybe what's most important is not rushing to do all these things that you're supposed to do in, in your day, but to see what needs to be done with these connections. So maybe most important isn't rushing or getting right all these appointments done in your day, right? Um, rabbi Joy Levitt, who I believe is still the head of the JCC in Manhattan, brilliant rabbi, really wonderful leader, um, is in this book and, and also in his previous book, The Relational Handbook. This is Ron Wolfson, the great rabbi, uh, Dr. Ron Wolfson, who was the founder or co-founder with Rabbi Larry Hoffman of Synagogue 2000. It's all about the importance of relationship as the foundation of Judaism. And Joy Levitt um, is quoted as telling her staff, asking them to assess how well they're doing. And they all come back with a sheet of programs, effective programs, et cetera, revenue, et cetera. She says, I want everybody to block out two hours in their day, one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, I want you to walk out in the hall and talk to people. That's it. That's success. It's not about programs. It's about people, says Ron Wolfson. It's about relating. It's about being present. It's about, so if you have so many appointments in your day, you can't be fully present. What's your day about? What are you doing? Minna. Also, the Rebbe is saying, saying Kol Nidre is fine, but it was more important to comfort this child. That's, that was what was um, more holy. And th this wasn't Shabbos morning, by the way. No, it was this, is, this is the holiest day of the year. They're trying to make a point. The Hasidim are trying to say, ritual is fine. Being high and holy is very important. But you know what's more important? A crying baby. Caring about another, really caring about another human being, and where you lose yourself in, in, as you were saying, lose yourself in time so that you and they become one. So now let me redeem my wife. Um, uh, so many times, not once or twice, 30 times in my life, maybe more, probably more, we were going someplace and something happened where somebody else, it was a need. And what would she do? Stop and help them. Which always got me so frustrated. I'm thinking, we got to get to this thing by three o'clock. What are you doing? Somebody's dog in the neighborhood is loose. What does she do? She starts making us run after, I don't know. A little kid had a bike accident. Um, before there was a Starbucks where Starbucks is, wasn't there a luggage store someplace there? Yep. Yes, a luggage yes. stop or something, yes. right? Yes, so there's yes. a luggage store. It must be 25 years ago. The little boy has a bike accident. Everybody's rushing by. We're supposed to be someplace. She stops. She says, run to the car. Get, get me my uh, thing, my scarf. I'm going to use this Band-Aid. She wraps the kid in the Band-Aid, waiting for the, the, come, the ambulance to come or the police. Um, and he's crying. And she said, stop. You're fine. What's the, what's the problem? He wasn't supposed to be going for a bike ride. He told his father he wouldn't ride his bike till later. He's so afraid his father's going to take away his bike. What does my wife say? We're going to wait here. I'll talk to your father. <laughs> and we did. Because I, never told, I didn't tell my wife no. So she was doing the right thing. She didn't care about time. She didn't care we were supposed to be at some rabbinic thing. It didn't matter to her. She was doing what God wanted her to do. She was being fully present for another human being. So she taught me immeasurable lessons. I'm not as good at it as she was, but I'm much better than I ever used to be. So what, what's the point of covenantal love? Why is it so crucial? And how, how can we embrace it even in the coming week, which may be the most crucial moment of our, of our, of our time, our chance? Um, Lisa, have you read yet? Read that paragraph. Why is love the antidote to fear and hate? This is again, Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson. Um, why is love the antidote to fear and hate? 
scripture tells us, Olam Chesed Ibena, Ibene, I will build this world of love. The cosmic force of building a new and better world is love. Supernovae give, give of their core to spawn new generations of galaxies and to forge the elements that make life possible. Love is the engine that drives life's expansion toward greater consciousness. It's not a small thing. By the way, if you want to read a book of theology that is um, sort of, uh, he calls it a process theology, very much like Harold Schulweis. It is Br Bradley Shabit's Arson's God of Becoming and Relationship. Good book. A good book. Thick, but a good book. Um, and he has a whole chapter on how science, in its essence, is a reflection of, of chesed, covenantal love. Um, love is the engine that drives life's expansion to a greater consciousness. That fully aligns with Buber. What is it telling us about covenantal love, about chesed? The more we're able to bring love into the world, the more open the more gracious, the more giving the world becomes, and thus the healthier our planet. It's a fuel efficient model. The word fuel is in quotes because fuel is the love that drives humanity or humankind. We don't generate enough love. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King taught the greatest power we have, right? He wrote an essay called The Power of Love. And he, he differentiated between two different Latin words for love. Um, what, 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 is, what is all of this telling us? If you encounter conflict, if you encounter hate, now, unlike, just to know, when Buber, Buber in a different book, um, I have it downstairs. I don't remember the name of it, but it's essays by Buber. One of them is Buber's essay in response to Gandhi um, in uh, 1947. It was after the Holocaust. But what did Gandhi say in 1944? That um, that Jews who are you know trying to be taken to the to, to, to just give themselves over. They should just lay down on the tracks and be slaughtered, or they should, you know, that, that that is the only thing they can do. And Buber said, hell no. Jews aren't going to give themselves up to be killed and slaughtered. So even Buber understood there's a time when love doesn't conquer all. In the face of senseless, causeless, baseless hate, we have to stand up and defend ourselves. But hopefully that will not be the tenor of the Thanksgiving gathering you share. And so how can we respond around the table? Let's say for example, that you're in a family which grew up in Northern Massachusetts and most of them are now in Southern New Hampshire. And some of them may have different political opinions than you. And those things may come up or maybe not. Or you name it, all those points of contention. How do you respond? is the question. Can you summon covenantal love? It's a tall order. Here's my favorite. It's my teacher and ours, Rabbi Larry Kushner. I'm going to read a little bit, then I'm going to ask you what he's talking about. This is from his book called The Book of Words. He has a two-page entry where he basically redefines a key word based on his sort of psycho-spiritual, mystical definition. This is his definition of Yisrael, which happens to be the name we all share. Home is where they have to let you in simply because you are you. <clears throat> and family are the people who live there. They are the ones whom you get, whether you like them or not. <laughs> in the last tally, they may be all any of us have. As Rabbi Adin Steinzoltz is once alleged to have quipped, the worst thing about being a Jew is that you have to associate with them. 
Um, <clears throat> Steinsaltz, by the way, is the great Baal Tshuva. He's the born again Jew who became very traditional, became a Talmudic master, and is still alive. Is, a, is Steinsaltz still alive or did he die? I don't remember. I don't remember. But Steinsaltz did the modern Hebrew translation of the Talmud that so we can understand it and it was translated into English. So I have about half of it downstairs. It's the, the best way to learn Talmud. Um, the, and now he's going to relate this to congregational life and then back to our family lives. It builds the bridge nicely to my next session. The power of congregational life comes precisely from this involuntariness of association. We look about the room and realize these people are not our friends. We do not agree with them about much, but these are the people we are stuck with. The often cited teaching of the sages that, in Hebrew, kol Yisrael arevin zebazeh, all Israel are intermingled with one another, probably means something more like we are all stuck with one another. This generates a kind of love, both more intense and more complicated than the voluntary variety. Now he's going back to family. For this reason, the place where you grew up with your family, where you became who you are, is called home. Every subsequent home is really, really only a pale replica of your first home. In this way, every table at which you sit, every place you live becomes sacred. Mm -hmm. What is he saying about the nature of family and how coming home to each other, even in a family setting, can maybe bring covenantal love to life. What's he saying? Pretty good. Well, if the love we share is not voluntary, meaning, of course we love you. You're the family. Of course I love you. I may not like you that much right now. I may not think what you're doing is really that smart or agrees, I don't, you know, I think you're a nut, but I love you. So that is both more intense and more complicated than the voluntary variety of love. But he's saying something else. The Hebrew text, kol Yisrael arevin zebazeh, all Israel are intermingled with one another, really means we're all jumbled up together. When you want to bake a cake and you want to mix it up, the word arevin is the word you would see in the recipe. Mix well. So what do we mean? We are the ingredients of a cake. Sometimes the ingredients mix really well, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the cake comes out and it looks like Julia Child made it. Is Julia Child a good cook? Yes. Okay. Um, right? Sometimes it ain't so hot. It's a little tilted, it fell in on the side. So it needs a little repair. We are all mixed together. We are all part of each other. If we know that, love is the foundation that not only makes it possible for us to be together, but it makes me who I am in relationship to you. It's not easy. It's not easy. How many people see sell. it? Say it again. It's a very tough sell, Rabbi, when, you, when we go to the Wailing Wall and uh, the poor women of the wall are being culted and, and attacked and beset by the ultra-Orthodox who take issue with their right to even be there. So it's very hard to say we're all in this together and uh, we have to accept each other because we're family. It's very difficult. I'm not sure how no, they- No, I, 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 no, Andy, I, just to clarify, Andy, um, 
you know, he's talking about, notice what Kushner does. He, he defines family as Yisrael. So that's his definition. He's using the idea of congregational life, people who choose to connect to a congregation as the model to understand what I would say is home and what home means and what coming home can mean and what existing in a home can mean. He's not talking about the denominational strife and struggles within the greater Jewish family. He's not meaning that at all. And I would say to you, you're right. And th this, this session is not about that in the least. This session is about, okay, here's where we're ending. It's gonna be Thanksgiving in a week. You're gonna be around a table. God willing, you'll be with family. Hopefully you still love them to a degree. <laughs> Hopefully you love them a lot. There are gonna be people there who are harder to love and even harder to like. What's the antidote? The response of tradition and not so much tradition. My response is chesed, covenantal love. It's opening your heart even when it's hard. It's thinking, what pains her? Why is it that she feels, he feels, they feel hurt? Why is it so hard for him to be here? Trying to understand that other person, and I'm not saying we ever will fully understand, but trying to understand or opening yourself to the possibility that your way isn't the only way is a big deal. That is the beginning, the entry point of an I thou moment. Questions, comments, I put a lot on the table. By the way, in the meantime, about 40 people showed up in the room. So I just want you to know. <laughs> any questions, any comments? You guys are so good. So I'll leave you with uh, anybody. I don't, want, I don't want to preempt anybody. I'm going to give you my last story. <laughs> Can I yes, yes, Lisa, Lisa, please. Um, I, I think, I just think you're amazing how you can do this with so many people, Jeffrey, see people this way. Oh, you know, how, how I can respond with chesed? No, how you can put, put an I thou relationship with so many um, it, it, to be present in, in that way for so many people, it's amazing. I thank you very much. I appreciate it. By the way, I'm not running for office. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, I, but you know what? It, think about it this way, Lise. It, it's, it's so much more effort to, to be hateful. It's so much, it, it's so, it takes so much more like stuff, you know, and, and, and hate makes you, you know, being nasty, being non-responsive, being cold, you know, I think that turns, it makes your insides sort of yicky. So I think, you know. I don't even mean the loving kindness. I just mean how you seem to understand people's souls. You know what? I, I'm a really good listener. I don't, I don't see outsides, I see inside. So just, it's just my nature, but thank you. I think we all can do it. And I think we all have the ability, again, the next time you actually say, so Mark, how you doing? Stop to listen. Because Mark has something to say. I, sometimes I say things like, hey, you know what? If you want to talk, I'm, I'm always here. And then what happens? That person calls me and I have to spend an hour and a half talking to them. And you know what? It's great because they teach me something about me and about life and about the world that I may not have known or recognized. That's why I'm here. I can always learn the next line of Torah or find the commentary. That's always easy. But to spend quality time with another person in pain or celebrating, or that's what life is for. So, um, 
there for you. When, uh, yeah, go please, back, Carol. Go back to the beginning. Olam chesed yibana. Yes. I will build this world with love, and you must yes. build this world with love. That's it. We sing it all the time, and it's what where we have to come from. Yeah, it's what Watchman Temple as a congregation is about. What does it mean that we're a covenant community? It means that we have a three-pillared covenant, but it means that we are in relationship with each other, whether we want to be or not. <laughs> we have to be here for each other, even when it's hard. But can I just... Jerry. Okay, so I'm contrarian, not contrarian, but a practical person. Time is, is finite. It's really tough to be present for everyone because then in some ways you can't be present for the people who really matter. And so that yeah. I think what I struggle with sometimes is being choiceful with when I can be present. And by the way, also not depleting myself because at some point you can be present for everyone else and then you're just depleted at the end. Anyway, yeah. being a cynic. No, 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 I, no, Jerry, I love that. And in fact, I would say to you, the, the, um, this is no small thing. The Musar rabbis, right? The rabbis of sort of the ethical self-help, self-improvement um, system created by three Lithuanian rabbis in the 19th century, the Musar folks. The Musar rabbis actually ask this question and demand that say, one of the midot is balance. Meaning you really have to listen to what Hillel said. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? You have to strike the balance. And it, what, what family comes first? You have to take care of family. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I'm guilty of this, especially as a young rabbi. It's, it was much easier for me to take care of that family, those people, their problems than mine. But thank goodness I had a life partner who said, you're home at six o'clock. We're having dinner. The kids, you're putting them to sleep. That was it. I was present. Why? Because I learned I needed to be present. Right? So being there for the people who matter most is sometimes hardest. But being there for them means the world. And it doesn't always, by the way, even though I will say most of the time, my being there for the other people, Lisa, as you mentioned, fills me. Sometimes it is depleting and exhausting. Do a funeral with a needy family. It's, it's hard. It's, it's the most important thing we can do and that I can do as a rabbi, but it's hard. So after it, I have to like, you know, watch a baseball game and, and you know, and eat something good and hang out with my family. But that's good, that's okay. So it is a balance and you can't help everybody. You have to make those choices. But if you're open to it, you never know when an I thou moment might happen. And those I thou moments, I really do believe are glimpses of God's presence in the human face. Folks, I appreciate all your time. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you build your, your world with love even if it's not that easy. And um, I hope you know that um, we are always here in support of your efforts uh, to make the world a little kinder. Uh, if you're doing nothing tomorrow night or you wanna be part of it, Larchmont Avenue Church, our interfaith community, Larchmont Mamaroneck Thanksgiving service. All the clergy from Larchmont Mamaroneck will be there. Um, I think I'm giving the benediction, I think. You know what? I think I'm going to tell a story. You just convinced me. I, I know what story I'm going to tell. I just realized. I'm going to tell a story. Rabbi, is it story. 7 or 7.30? Yes. Do you know? 7. <laughs> I think it's 7. I think it's Cantor, 7. Cantor told us last night it's 7. Thank you. Thank you. I knew that. I knew that. The singers have to warm up at 6.15. So okay, 7. 7. Okay. I'll be there right on time. Okay. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanks, Thanksgiving. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Be well. Thank you. You too. Thank you.